Therefore, say to the house of Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Sovereign Lord, when I show myself holy through you before their eyes. For I will take out of the nations, I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. You will live in the land I gave your forefathers. You will be my people and I will be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness. I will call you. I will call for the grain and make it plentiful and will not bring famine upon you. I will increase the fruit of the trees and the crops of the field so that you will no longer suffer disgrace among the nations because of famine. Then you will remember your evil ways and wicked deeds and you will loathe yourselves for your sins and detestable practices. I want you to know that I am not doing this for your sake, declares the Sovereign Lord. Be ashamed and disgrace for your conduct, O house of Israel. May God bless the reading of His Word to your soul. You may be seated. Okay. We don't have uh, our fill in the blanks today. If you look under your sermon notes, the title of the sermon is Life's Most Important Pursuit. And we're going to be looking at Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Happy Fourth of July, by the way. Thank you. Um, we're going to look at Matthew 7, 21 through 23, the last portion uh, of the Sermon on the Mount. It has some very important word, war, words of warning, words of exhortation. And as I was thinking about it this week, um, I don't think it's overstating the matter to say that these three little verses... Let me read them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So I don't think it's overstating the matter to say that these uh, three little verses contain some of the most serious, some of the most, to me, anyways, frightening words that will ever be spoken. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And these words are spoken to professing believers. They're spoken to people who, like I said there, you know, are ministering, performing miracles, doing things in Jesus' name. It's speaking to professing believers. It's speaking to the church. It's speaking to those who are, if you were to ask them if they were saved, they say, oh yeah, I'm saved. And, um, and yet Jesus says here, there's a, a stern warning here. And these are words that certainly no one expects to hear or wants to hear. On the opposite side of that spectrum, these verses contain some of the most blessed hope-filled words for those who truly know Jesus. So, Lord Jesus, we just thank you uh, for your word. We pray for the outpouring of your spirit, the move of your hand on um, these three little beautiful verses here this morning, what you want uh, your people to hear 
as it relates to um, the warning and the proclamation and uh, the judgment and also the hope that are contained in these beautiful verses. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So knowing the Lord is life's most important pursuit. That, that, that's really the key, knowing the Lord. And um, knowing the Lord is life's knowing the Lord is life's most important pursuit is because there is here a false profession of faith and a, fall, a final declaration of judgment in these verses, okay? The false profession of faith is not anyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven um, will enter. And this really goes back to, I'm also going to take it all the way back to Matthew 7, 13 through 14, the broad road that leads to death, the narrow path that leads to life. Certainly it really does go back to that. Verse 13 says, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who will enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. And then it's illustrating that here, as this is the end of the Sermon on the Mount. It's illustrating it here with the Matthew 7, 15 through 20, and the tree and the fruit and the false prophets, and you will know them by their fruit. And then this passage, and then the passage that follows about building your house on the rock versus building it on the sand. So there's a false profession of faith in Christ. It's like building your life on sand. So Jesus told his audience to be a guard against the false prophets. In the light of that warning, he says here in Scripture, what it says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourself to see if you're of the faith. And so that's okay to do. I, you know, I remember, um, I'm getting ahead of myself here in, the, in this message, I think, but I, I remember um, a friend of mine when he used to work at uh, Eastern Bag and Paper, I shared this illustration before, and she said she was saved, and she said the sinner's prayer, and they told her, don't ever doubt your salvation now. And that's not really biblical, I don't think, really. The Bible talks about, we're going to get into this quickly here in a minute under application, about he who perseveres to the end will be saved. There's the perseverance of the saints. But, you know, to say to someone, never doubt your salvation, it's like, she said the prayer, she, she saved, and I confronted her about how she was living her life apart from the Lord. And, um, and, and she's like, well, I guess, I said, but you said you're saved, you said you're born again, and... and this is what the Bible says, and yet you're living this way. In essence, I said, you know, you're not doing the will of the Word of God. It was like obvious how she was living. And, and she said to me, well, I guess, that, but they told me, don't ever question myself. And they told me, don't ever doubt your salvation. And, and, and as we talked more, she said, well, I guess I'm just not ready to make that kind of commitment like, like, like what you're talking about. Wow. And, and so, it's like, and there's a lot of people... Like that. Before we think about a lot of pe other people. <clears throat> hey guys. Hi. Try to listen. Okay? Try to listen. Because you're going to be going on a crosswalk. That's like a big, huge spiritual weekend where we're all pumped up to go and worship the Lord. So if we can't worship the Lord right here, you know, it's going to be hard to go up there. Okay? Sorry. Um, knowing the Lord's most important pursuit is important because of there's a false profession of faith. So he says there, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. Uh, so we see here uh, what we have in love. The people who, whom Jesus condemns are branded as false because um, their life and their lips sort of weren't in harmony. There's an exclamation here, Lord, Lord. Um, there's, a, there's an intensity of it here, Lord, Lord, but there's not um, a following through really of, uh, of the relationship. So the Puritans use the word, the Puritans use the word called false peace, used to describe those who are self-deceived. So there's a tendency to base our salvation only upon um, things that we say, right? Um, but only him who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So the determining factor regarding what is the kingdom of heaven is obedience to God's will, obedience to the Father's will. Um, 
It's not simply one who claims the Lord, um, but he who does the will or the desire of the Father that is truly a disciple of Jesus. So the issue of obedience. Now we know that obedience isn't, you know, what it isn't like, okay, you do this and you're saved. Obedience, it's not obedience that saves us, but obedience is the essence, the fruit bears, is the fruit of a life that's following after Jesus, as opposed to that illustration that I gave earlier I, and I, and that I gave. So look at verse 22. Just thinking about this false profession of faith. It says, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons. And in your name perform many miracles. So it's clear. Obviously you've read this passage before. It's clear from this passage that um, people, there'll be a group there, astonished. Astonished at the second coming of Jesus in those words. And you know, I mean, I think of those words too. We all, we all have to think of those words. Not Again, examine yourself to see if you're of the faith. I still keep saying at some point I want to preach on the, the judgment, actual judgment seat of Christ uh, in 2 Corinthians and in 1 Corinthians 3. Um, and I will do that at some point. Lord willing. So the passage here has in their mind the final judgment, okay? Uh, the whole ch chapter has been a warning again. Christian must live their entire life in light of his coming. So the key here is knowing the Lord, right? Whether we really truly know the Lord. And uh, there's a false profession. And then there's a final declaration, verse 23. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice Lawlessness. I mean, that is like, what a terrible word that is. What a dreadful separation that is. Depart from me. Um, those who are self-deceived concerning their salvation made a false profession of faith in Christ. And Jesus, in turn, will pronounce a final profession or final judgment on them. I never knew you. You never really had anything to do with me. Um, you've been deceiving and fooling yourselves the whole time. Depart from me, you practice lawlessness or evilness. You know, that's the essence of it, too. The words practice lawlessness is uh, in the original, it's a present participle, um, indicating continuous action, indicating like regular action, in indicating ongoing lifestyle, uh, unrighteous, habitual disobedience to God. So our life here is a reflection. Our life is a reflection of um, what we live for. He says, depart from me. Again, those are the words of final sentence of eternity without Christ. To depart from Christ is the is hell, right? It's the, it's the misery of hell. It's the foundation of all the misery of the damned to be cut off from all hope of Christ. The Bible says in Revelation 20, 15, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. So the lake of fire and eternal separation from Christ await those false professors. Depart from me. And you hear that. The, the emotion, like, um, I don't know, like, um, and I'm glad you guys moved up front. That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> You're all doing really good. Amen. If I said that to um, somebody else, like, uh, if I said it to like, a parent, they wouldn't have done that. They wouldn't have moved forward. You guys move forward. I said, hey, come on, pay attention. You move forward. That's cool. <laughs> Okay, amen. Okay, so I think about your parents. They give you. They give you. Actually, that's a good illustration of what you just did. But um, when they have a word of encouragement or a word of warning from you for you, like you know, don't do that, or um, they're trying to give you correction, right? Or are trying to admonish you. The words could be really, you know, strong. And these are really, really, really strong words of Jesus when Jesus says, "Depart from me. I never." knew you, those who practice 
lawlessness. Nothing could be worse than that, right? Than being banished forever uh, from the presence of the Lord. Nothing could be more terrible than that. So there's the false profession. There's the final declaration of judgment. And now I have like a whole bunch of scriptures that we're going to read, that I'm going to read to share with you as it relates to this. Thinking about knowing the Lord and, um, and this applies to all of us, okay? Think about on the flip side, on the one side we have depart from me, right? On the other side you got enter into the joy of their master for those who are saved. So um, let's look at some fruit, some fruit of those who know the Lord, okay? And you can think about it this week, too, for yourself. Think about what are some fruit, what are some evidences that I know the Lord, apart from just saying I know the Lord, right? Apart just from a profession of uh, one's lips. So I just thought of a few of them, and you could text me or email me this week if you think of some other ones. I'm sure there's tons more. But for one thing, those who know the Lord, I said it early, earlier, examine this themselves to see if they're of the faith. Okay? 2 Corinthians 13.5 So it's biblical for us, for people, to uh, examine themselves to see if they're of the faith as opposed to just saying like that person said to me, well, you know, I'm saved and I'm still never to doubt my salvation. I mean, there's an element of there's an element of um, the persevering in the faith that I'm going to read here at some point. What's someone saying when they're saying don't ever doubt your salvation? They're saying that you can't lose your salvation. And that's true. You can't, a person who's genuinely saved can't lose their salvation. You know, because God is the one who does the saving. But again, there's the element of examine ourselves to see if we're of the faith. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Or I've used this illustration before from my seminary class, my theology class. Um, um, he said, faith that fizzles before the finish was faulty from the first. And that's probably more, definitely more biblical um, than just saying, hey, you're okay, you're safe, don't worry about it, and no matter what, how you're living, don't, don't question it. In the Constitution, I hope I wrote that thing, uh, I lost it somewhere in the shuffle of uh, life this morning. Um, in the Constitution, there's a whole section on persevering in the faith. And I was going to read it, but I don't have it with me to read, so that's okay. Um, there's a whole section on what does it mean to persevere in the faith. But let me just read a couple of verses about that. Okay, so those who know the Lord examine themselves, those who know the Lord will persevere in the faith. All right, so. Let me just read a couple of verses. Matthew 24, 13. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Okay, John 10, 27 through 30. John 10. My sheep know my voice, and I, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them, I give eternal life to them, and they shall never perish. No one shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. This is a perseverance of the faith verse. John 6, 66. As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew, and we're not walking with him anymore. When it, and in John, where he uses that word disciples, it's referring to loosely attached people that um, were kind of hanging around, appeared to be disciples, appeared to be followers, but weren't. And the question was, what, what revealed their lack of being a true disciple was their obedience to the word. Um, verse 67 says, so Jesus said to the twelve, you don't want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter answered and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And Jesus answered them, Did I not myself choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is the is a devil? He's referring there to Judas. Um, and then the most famous, probably, perseverance of the faith, perseverance of the saint verse is 1 John 2.19, where it says, They went out from us, and they departed from us, because they were not of us. They left, they appeared to be followers, they appealed to be disciples, they left, they went out from us, 
because they weren't truly disciples and followers of us. So those who know the Lord will persevere in the faith. Those who know the Lord will work out their salvation with fear and trembling. That's Philippians 2, 12 through 13. So then, my beloved, just as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So you know that verse. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. There's a, there's a hatred of sin in your heart. There's a being, you know, now wanting to do the very thing that you uh, that you keep you keep doing the very thing you hate, like it says in Romans 7, there's a not wanting to do that. There's a desire for uh, cleansing, there's a desire to be um, repentant, to change, right? And that's that working out your salvation with fear and trembling. You're not working for your salvation. Yourself, it's not what saves you, but there's a there's a working it out out of reverence for God. So those who truly know the Lord have a godly fear and reverence for the Lord, right? Um, Psalm 112, verse 1 says, um, Praise the Lord, how blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. Um, Psalm 128, verse 1 says the same thing. How blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. There's a reverence, there's a fear. Proverbs 3, verse 7 puts it this way. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. So those who know the Lord, there's a fear, there's a reverence, uh, a holy fear. In your bulletin under the quote for the week, I started putting in quotes for the week. This is from Charles Spurgeon. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Look well into your state. See whether you be in Christ or not. It's the easiest thing in the world to give a lenient verdict when oneself is to be tried. But oh, be just and true here. Be just to all, but be vigorous to yourself. He had a whole devotion on June 26th. I could read the whole thing to you on the morning. His, his daily devotion, morning by morning, and the one that goes night by night. Um, that's, quite a, that's quite an illustration. So those who know the Lord will have a godly fear. Those who know the Lord will have a reverence. They will strive after holiness. You know, this is working out your salvation with fear and trembling. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Pursue peace with all men. And the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. So there's a striving after holiness. There's a growing in sanctification. It says without that, no one will see the Lord. So it's, it's not just that static saying something with your mouth or saying words at some point. There's a, there's a working out. There's a being sanctified. There's a being changed. Another series of words too. Without that sanctification, no one will see the Lord. First uh, Peter 1, 15 and 16. But the Holy One who called you says, Be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. So those who know the Lord, there's a striving after holiness. Those who know the Lord, there's a striving to know Him more. One of my favorite verses, Philippians 3.10, Paul says, I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection. Those who know the Lord will repent of lukewarmness to the Lord. I call it you know, half in, half out, pokey pokey, <laughs> Christianity, you know, the Bible says, Revelation 3, yeah, 16, I know you're sorry, 15, I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot, I wish that you were cold or hot, so because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. From Revelation. Those who know the Lord will repent of lukewarmness. Those who know the Lord will return to their first love. Um, Revelation 2 4 says this. You know these verses. Um, I have this against you. You've forsaken 
your first love. Any one of us can kind of fall into that category, even for even for what maybe like a temporary moment or two. You know, remember your first love. Remember when you were saved. Remember your vigor. Remember your excitement. Remember your enthusiasm for the Lord. Remember your desire for the Lord. And now, other stuff. Sorry, other stuff. Modern technology stuff or other stuff. Just it's like this is love more sometimes than the word. More time is spent here than with our first love, Jesus Christ. Those who know the Lord will return to their first love. Those who know the Lord will repent of the idols of their heart. 1 Corinthians 10, 14 says, Therefore, my beloved, flee idolatry. Matthew 15, 19 says, Brought in the heart come evil thoughts, murderers, adulterers, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. There's a repentance of the idols of our heart. There's a repentance over our lukewarmness. There's a repentance over our forsaking our forced love and allowing the world's values, the world's entertainment, the world's fashion um, to have more of a lure on us than Christ does. But there's a repentance. It's a key word for those who truly know the Lord. 1 John 2, 15, 17 says, Don't love the world nor the things of the Lord. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life, pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away and also its lust, but the one who does the will of the Father lives forever. Those who know the Lord, a couple more, will demonstrate their love for the Lord by obedience to his word. I never forget, uh, let me read the verse, John 14, 21 and 23. It says, uh, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will love by my Father, and I will love him and disclose myself to him. Verse 23 says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. So like the, the genuine believer, the true believer in Christ, the one who's persevering in the faith, the one who's working out their salvation with fear and trembling, one confronted with the word of God in an area of uh, sinful disobedience will confess and repent and turn from it and recognize it. Right? person who truly knows what will ask the Lord to help them to bear fruit in keeping of repentance, which would be Matthew 3, verse 8. Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Lord, help me. Help me to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. The person who knows the Lord will demonstrate an ever-increasing degree. This is the last one, okay? They'll reveal an everlasting, an ever-increasing degree that Jesus Christ is the all-surpassing value in the all-surpassing treasure of your life. That's like where the rubber hits the road here. Jesus is the treasure. Jesus is the pearl. Their life, their actions, our life, our actions will demonstrate that. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid again and from joy over it. <laughs> Over joy over it goes and sells all he has and buys that field. Over the joy that he has in knowing Jesus. Over the joy over he has in finding that treasure. The person who knows the Lord will treasure Jesus Christ more and more as the all-surpassing value of their life. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. So, the text, central idea is knowing the life's most important Knowing the Lord is life's most important pursuit. And because that's so important, we see here a false profession of faith and a final declaration of judgment. So, the question is, do you know the Lord? Are we the Lord's? Do we belong to the Lord? Has He truly saved us? What effect does He have upon our life today as it relates to all those illustrations that I gave about what it looks like in the life of the believer 
as opposed to just empty, vain repetition or empty words. Um, so I'm ending with this. Okay. The contrast between these words. Um, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Contrast it with Matthew 25, 21. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. So Jesus, we do just praise you and thank you for uh, this warning, for this encouragement in your word about the blessedness of life with you, Lord, and the seriousness of those words that um, the most maybe the most tragic words that will ever be uttered and heard by a person. But for me, I never knew you. Even though you said to me, Lord, Lord, even though you professed to know me, your actions reveal that you don't know me. And so the flip side of that is the opportunity we have to truly know the Lord and to enter into the joy of our Master's inheritance and the opportunity to repent and the opportunity to live for Jesus more as the all-surpassing value and treasure of our life. So Lord, please, by the power of the Holy Spirit, help us to respond to uh, your words here this morning. For one, and maybe turning to Jesus Christ in repentance and faith to be saved. To, uh, to others, it may be um, repenting. Um, for the unsaved, it would be repenting and turning to Jesus. For the false professor, it would be repenting and turning to Jesus. For a believer, it would be... Um, thinking about Jesus as the all-surpassing value and treasure of our life in areas where we need to examine ourselves, in areas where we need to turn to the Lord in repentance and asking Him to fill us with His Spirit that we would be more obedient, that we would go further and deeper uh, in Him. So Lord, we thank You and we praise You. We lift our hearts up to You in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.